Can women be treated with testosterone along with their HRT, hormone replacement therapy? We're here with an expert in women's health and men's health and, and, the, and treating wellness. And we're going to discuss it after this, so keep watching. Hi, I'm Mike, the founder of Balance My Hormones, where we help men and women on their journey to optimal hormone balance. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and leaving comments so we can address them at the end of our videos. So today we're here with Dr. O'Neill Smith from Treating Wellness, her name of her clinic, who's going to address some of the issues of HRT for women, but also the question is, can a, can a woman be given testosterone treatment? Because there's again, a lot of myths around testosterone and what it might do to women. So thanks for coming on. And uh, it's great uh, to be here. Yeah, great you. to be here. It's a great topic. Yeah. It's a really important. Testosterone for women is hot in the States. Hot, hot, hot. Um, I would say that most people are finally tuned into it because it is part of balancing all of the hormones. And many women at any point in life, you know, we have to remember that when we're going through puberty and and growing 15 years of age to 30 years of age, and when we can have babies, we have very balanced levels of hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. If you think of just simply bone, estrogen will help you uh, build bone, progesterone can help you maintain bone, and testosterone can strengthen bone. So if you don't have adequate testosterone, you're not going to be well. So everything needs to be in balance. Too little testosterone, you may not have any muscle mass, bone mass, right? Yeah. So those things to think about. Too much, you may have insulin resistance. So finding the right balance for a particular patient is important in women. So what would a, a woman who's low on testosterone, let's say they're not menopausal, right. what would their symptoms be if they have low testosterone for a woman? Is it the similar to what a, what a man would feel? Or? It's similar, but it's a little bit more aligned to well-being in terms of um, their arousal, their sexuality, etc. So that's a big one. I would say muscle mass and body composition, which is one of the things I care most about because that's an indicator of how well you're aging. Yeah. If your muscles are strong, I'm not talking about big, you know, muscles that are going to pop. I'm talking about having good body composition, uh, body fat percent that's for a young woman in childbearing years, somewhere around, I don't know, pick a number, 23, 25%, but not 30%, yeah. right? So anywhere between 20 and 25% is pretty healthy. So, but if your body composition, and I've had young women in their 20s with body composition and body fat percent of 40%, they are imbalanced in their hormones. They are estrogen dominant and they are imbalanced. So we need to re restore balance in their homo hormonal levels. So, but isn't there a fear that uh, from some women that if they take the testosterone, they will grow a beard or become <laughs> more manly or maybe have aggression issues? But I have had yeah. women who, not many, I have had men who have prescribed testosterone to, this is 15 years ago. Yeah. And the, those men treated their women with testosterone and they overtreated them. So they gave them the dose they were taking. Oh. That's a different story, right? Okay. So I, I mean, that is not necessary to do because a woman is different. So if you, if you microdose testosterone, whether it's injection or you're doing uh, creams with testosterone or uh, vaginal creams with testosterone, they can be very, testosterone can be very effective. Is there a better place then to, for, for the creams for, for women to, to put? You mentioned a vaginal, you mentioned um, other topical, um, you mentioned injections even. Is there yeah. a preferred method or does it depend on what's going to work best for the, for the woman? I think it depends on the person. Some people have pellets put in so that they sure. last for a long time. That's very common in the States. I'm not the greatest pellet fan because you can't change the dose once you put the pellet yeah. in, right? They're going to get the dose that they get. And they're and stuck you, with it. And they're stuck with yeah. it. So I believe in managing, you know, either daily or weekly the dose that you're going to take. If it's, if it's a cream, you're going to do it daily. daily yeah. And if it's an injection, you may microdose it once or twice a week as well. I have women who do both. What kind of dose would you expect for a woman for, for injections for testosterone? What kind so, of you know, something on the order of 20 to 50, we do milligrams. Per week or per dose? Per dose. Per dose. Mm -hmm. 20 okay. milligrams, 50. And again, following the levels, 
in the yeah. plasma. I follow the plasma. And mostly I follow the plasma because I want to compare apples to apples instead of apples to bananas or oranges. Yeah. So I take pick one method that I will use to understand the range. You can measure the peak and the nadir. So you can measure the peak of the testosterone level if you measure it within 24 to 36 hours. And you can measure the nadir, which is the low point of the testosterone before the next dose. So I typically will get peak, do peak measurements and nadir measurements so that I can understand the ranges that the patients are okay. experiencing. And everyone is unique. Honestly, right. I have identical twins and they are unique. unique. Mm -hmm. Genetics yeah. are unique, right? Everything's unique. That's interesting. So do you have a lot of women that are doing injectable testosterone? Um, I have too many people that would prefer the pellets, to be pellets, honest okay, with you, because they don't yeah. want to inject. Yeah. Again, I'm not a fan because I've had people um, with the end up in a hospital for seven days looking for what's happening in their system because they don't feel well. I see. And once the testosterone runs out and we go back to a regular dosing that we can adjust more more readily, then they are much better. So athletes, and so that's pretty, I don't, I don't like to get into that because now we have that particular problem or challenge because we have three months before that's gonna run out. What, um, is it, what, what would you expect um, a female testosterone levels to, to be? Mm -hmm. um, on the trough for the nadia, yeah. what would what would twenty five, you, you know, in the United States, yeah. I don't know what that well, well, is. Twenty five, it's yeah. not very much. It's, it's not very, not much. very much. It's just a little bit, and and you know, adjusting is really important. A lot of my patients, like typically, if I start with the cream, I'll start with four mg per mL, and then we adjust from there. It's either one full mL or half or whatever they need. And again, my job is to teach my patients what they should be experiencing and feeling and what they shouldn't be experiencing feeling. So if they f don't feel good, then we adjust the dose. If they feel great, then we maintain it and measure. And are these doses similar to someone on, uh, who's menopausal on, on HRT, or is it a slightly different dose for a younger woman who may be having the issues of low testosterone? And how, do you, how often do you see younger women, maybe uh, you know, pre-menopausal, 30s, 40s? I would say you know, the group, the group of the number one group I have in my practice would be men between, okay. believe it or not, 30, maybe even younger, 25 to 60 years of age. Young women, I don't see that often. Interesting. Yeah. I would say then I see menopausal women. I see a lot of young men. I, don't, I have no idea why. And young women I see the least amount of, which is so wild to me. But have you heard at other, at other clinics, there's, yeah. there's a more of an uptake? Of there's more of an uptake. It's not the primary group, though. It would probably be 40 to 45 and up for right. testosterone treatment in the States. Okay, so for, for females then who are going through menopause, the, the HRT or even perimenopause, um, obviously testosterone is another option because we, we do at our clinic a balance of hormones. Right. And, um, and usually the dose is very small. It's like... Uh, I think the Tostrand gel, the 2% that they would put on it's every the other day. Mm -hmm. is it's it, the same dose, yeah. yeah. In, but not, not daily, or, or can some women, women you can benefit use it from daily. daily? Yeah, some people can so benefit from one, daily. So just one pump daily, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have quite a few. Most of them are postmenopausal 50s in their 50s, yeah. maybe 60s, but certainly 50s that will take one, one ml a day. But that's also along with uh, bioidentical estradiol. Always. Always. Or the biests and, yeah. and progesterone. Usually, I use biased. Okay. To try to get a balance mm -hmm. and progesterone. Okay. But I never, I, I don't usually treat only one hormone. I treat all three. You look hormones. at thyroid as well. You're looking at yeah, okay. Look at everything. Anything Insulin, that's deficient. Insulin, thyroid, cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and I don't know any woman perimenopausal or postmenopausal who doesn't need progesterone, of course, because they're yeah. all estrogen dominant. And then as they go through menopause and they're postmenopausal, they need some estrogen. But testosterone may be perimenopause or postmenopause. Okay. Right? So for, we were talking about injections for testosterone. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not sure if this is available, but would it be easier for some women? Can, and would you still consider it bioidentical? I believe um, when you've got testosterone and cypionate, there's also estradiol cypionate and valerate which is just an ester tied to a bioidentical right. molecule. So that would be, could still be considered under the realm of bioidentical for women. But Correct. it doesn't have the same safety profile as topicals, because I know there was some scare about oral estrogen right. versus um, you know, um, topical. 
Well, oral has first pass effect. It's going to go through the liver. It's going to get conjugated. It's going to have a very e different outcome. Even a bioidentical oral estrogen? Because in the UK, there's been a shortage of estrogel. Oh, really? A okay. massive shortage. I mean, luckily, our pharmacy, the hormone ministers, they've been able to get some because mm -hmm. we're very persistent. But, <laughs> but still, there's some other alternative topicals that we've had right. to use. But there was also mention of an oral bioidentical estrogen available. Maybe you're not, not familiar yeah, with Yeah, I'm not yeah. familiar with it. I mean, okay. I know that some of the pharmaceuticals in the states make those but we don't use very few people would use okay. an oral estrogen that i know of whether they're in gyn health longevity medicine regenerative regardless i don't know anybody who uses an oral okay yeah, yeah. and then we, we don't we don't use it either but because of the shortage right. and, you know some of our doctors were looking at, at alternatives but we have been able to supply that right. uh, secure the supply of estrogel and also there's compounded estrogens available or, or the bias available for right. for a female patient so right Okay, so one thought that we had was, well, you know, again, in, in light of the shortage, could the injectable uh, estradiol work along with a small bit of testosterone in there if you're going to do the injection? The thoughts? injections I like. I mean, the issue with any injection, whether it's an insulin injection, yeah. again, back to the type 1 diabetes, or is that you've got a peak, peak in, in the, the valley. Trough, yeah. So people feel those. So if you can find the sweet spot of how to be ahead of it instead yeah. of lagging behind it, then you're good because you want to optimize. So I think that, you know, I still like injectables because I know that they get into the system yeah. and I can titrate them a little bit more readily. So, but I think that that's the most important thing to be aware of is the peaks and valleys and how somebody's feeling. Well, this is um, that's interesting. So here, here's a question, it's kind of the opposite side, because for, and there's like recently an article about, I think, uh, a father who had a child and he had testo gel on, mm -hmm. and he exposed his child and the child became kind of precocious and, and mm -hmm. puberty, et cetera. But what about women with topical estradiol and that's in its effect on, on their male partners? Is there something that men should be worried about for their spouses who are on topical hormones, topical estrogen, not so much the testosterone, but the topical estrogen. Is that That's a really good question. Um, I would say, to be honest with you, knowing what I know about precociousness, yeah. I see a lot of young children who are precocious where there's no testosterone treatment involved. So to me, to, to make the correlation that it was the testosterone therapy, the TRT, yeah. that caused precociousness, I think is simple-minded. Okay, interesting. Uh, I yeah. really believe that with my entire heart, or I wouldn't say it on, on yeah. a podcast. So I think that there are so many interactions, and the body is so complex that it, it's, it just doesn't make sense to me. Especially seeing in my practice the young people that I do see. I do see plenty of people who are under 15, and they're having irregular cycles or things like that. And I, I see young boys that are... 10 to 15 with allergies or other things. And what I see in some of these people, particularly if they have poor diets or um, they, their sleep is off, which is often true for young people, in the young men, I see high estrogen levels. Mm. And, and I see relatively low testosterone. And in the young women, I see high testosterone levels and low estrogen. And my thought on that is adjuvant exposure or exposure to things that are endocrine disruptors. So an endocrine disruptor is more likely to cause precociousness in my mind yeah. than is a TRT in their father. I, I really, I have plenty of people who, wounded warriors, young wounded warriors in my practice, lots of them, so they're under 30 years of age, with testosterone total of 50 or 100. We treat them and they go on to have babies. And I have you know now several patients who have children who are 10, 12, there's no problem whatsoever. So connecting those dots, I think, is missing so many other variables yeah. that really need to be looked at. I really don't buy that. That's interesting. Okay, no, that's good. Um, I don't buy it. It just it seems it's such a small amount. And especially like in that article, they talked about he was always wearing T-shirts and that it would actually go through the T-shirt as well. I mean, how much contact exposure are you going to have to cause that sort of absorption? It just seems bizarre. And especially like what we use, a, a testo cream for the men. I mean, it's going on your testes. I mean, right, right. what kind of exposure are you going to get there? I <laughs> mean, just think about it in terms of we use, we use me mechanisms when we compound things to get, to get them into the system yes. faster. 
And so the reality is if you put sunscreen on, it doesn't last all that long. Yeah. <laughs> you have to re-sunscreen up multiple times during the day. If you could put something on that's colored and see how long that lasts, I'm, yeah, really just, on the testicles, I, I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't buy it. Speaking of sunscreen, though, they, they're also the endocrine disrupting hormones in the sunscreens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so they're so rampant. I mean, I, in the young wounded warriors that I see, and you see these young men who were fighting in war and were very strong, and they get wounded from whatever, for whatever reason, whether it's a brain injury or whatever, Havana syndrome, TBI, secondary to a fall or a blast or yeah. any other thing. And by age 28, they have a total testosterone of 50, uh -huh. when it normally at that age might be 800, right? So, so something caused dramatic estrogen disruption. The other thing I see in these young men, many of them don't have high estrogens. Obviously, they have low T. Testosterone goes to estrogen. There are other types of estrogen that you can make from yeah. insulin and others, but from having high insulin. But the reality is they have low estrogen, and they also have gynecomastia. And they've had multiple surgeries for gynecomastia or breast tissue. So there's, I believe that that has to be related to endocrine disruption in some other way. And so I think that we don't really know. I think that we have to be more, uh, how do you say, ex inquisitive in the way that we think about yeah. hormones and where they are and what they are. I don't think that we have all the information. Sounds like if you had um, like a male patient that, you know, regardless if he had borderline levels to the ranges, but if they had you know, previous gynecomastia, it sounds like there's some issue with the hormonal system anyway. Correct. Even correct. if it's corrected, that's still there, and so therefore your know, TRT could be a good option. That would be kind of like a, a great an open door to to offer that that testosterone treatment to that patient. So. Yes, a hundred percent. Interesting. So. Um, so I think that's it. Is anything else you want to add to for, uh, you know, female HRT or, or, or testosterone for, for, for women? I think it's... Uh, well, I think in terms of hormones, a lot of people fear breast cancer. And I think that, you know, the majority of breast cancer, when we think about it logically, happens postmenopausally when our hormone levels have been low for decades, yeah. right? Usually it's in the late 50s, 60s at the earliest, typically, if it's not genetically related and that's 95% or more of breast cancer. So I, there's no evidence that it's the estrogen that causes the breast cancer, or the specific kind of estrogen, estradiol, or biased yeah. estriol, that we're using to treat, um, to treat postmenopause. And, and if testosterone and progesterone, bioidentical progesterone, are Correct. added to the mix, shouldn't that reduce the risk of, of, of breast cancer 100%, potentially? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's some work by a very well-known uh, GYN in her 80s, still practicing um, in New York City, Dr. Noctegal, and she is conventional mm -hmm. in New York City, and sh whenever she sees a woman, she automatically wants to put them on hormones, bioidentical hormones, because she's done some work showing that as your hormone levels decline, particularly postmenopausally, brain atrophies. Uh -huh. So if the brain's going to atrophy, if there's one reason to take hormones, replacement therapy, TRT, HRT, it's definitely to keep your brain well. Right. Yeah, of course. There's the studies about, you know, Alzheimer's and right. a higher risk for those with low testosterone. Correct. Which was the same for, for females and estrogen. So. No matter what you're doing, you're looking for balance, yeah. right? And you're looking for optimization. And so that's the critical component. So you can measure and you can talk to the patient and understand how they're feeling. And you can look at the patient. Yeah. You can just look at the patient. You can understand whether this is working or not. So I, I think that men are treated in one direction and women are treated in another. And that's you know because of the way that our hormones are balanced at birth yeah. or during puberty. And that's what we want to continue to, to find. Good. That's, okay. that's what we can do at our, at our service as well. So thank you for coming on. And for everyone who's watching, again, please keep sending in your comments. Uh, feel, feel free to subscribe so you can get future content. And uh, we'll see you next time. And thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Okay. Pleasure. Good.